Hello everybody, welcome back. Today in chapter 9, section 2, we're going to be looking at a very important aspect of uh, the president's duties, and that is creating and sustaining a foreign policy. At this time, there was no, again, no precedence, which we talked about yesterday, so Washington had to kind of figure out what the foreign policy of the United States was going to be, and he actually got some help from a very unlikely place. And we see that in our essential question, how did the French Revolution aid in the development of political parties in the United States? So a revolution in France is going to kind of force the hand of the United States in figuring out what its uh, policy is going to be. But we will look, in, look at that very shortly. But first, the key terms. Our key terms for today, are French Revolution, foreign policy, we will talk about what a foreign policy actually is and what it looks like, neutral, or, which we've talked a little bit about before, neutrality proclamation, an official proclamation of neutrality, Jay's Treaty, and then we will end today talking with Washington's farewell address. But first, a question. Should you stand up and support your friends even if you don't agree with them? That's a great question. So, based on this picture, say your friend got arrested for doing something just stupid. Should you still support him? Or should you try and stay out of it in case something might happen to you? Now, America at this time was a very new nation. It was a brand new nation, only a few years old. And a revolution broke out in France, and there was a debate over whether or not to support France or to support our new trade allies, Great Britain. Now that sounds weird because we had just fought a war with them, but we were starting to trade with them a lot, and so we were becoming friends again. So our first video is going to explain a little bit more about the French Revolution. It's to kind of give us a, an idea of what was going on in France and how that would affect us here in the United States. And it will give a little bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about over the next couple of days. So first the video and then we'll get back into our lesson for today. By the end of the 1700s, the United States of America was a fledgling democracy whose foundation was challenged by conflicts within and outside the United States. War between Britain and France was disrupting U.S. trade, and Americans were divided over our policy of neutrality. The Alien and Sedition Acts grew out of this conflict. But first, some background. The central event, the defining event probably of that 1790s decade was the French Revolution. And what, what happened, of course, is Americans divided very sharply over, over the French Revolution. The analogy might almost be, analogies are dangerous in history, but I would say it, it might even be to the Cold War. The international context is important. We're in the, at the time engaged in a quasi-war with France, a, naval, a series of naval encounters, and a collection of hostile naval encounters with England off and on as well. More important is the domestic context. The political climate at the end of the century was such that many individuals more identified with their state than they did with the national government. And this created a sense of sectionalism, uh, which really is the precursor to the political party. So just a few years after the end of the American Revolution, there was an uprising in France that would eventually lead to France's own revolution. And the French Revolution toppled the established monarchy, the established uh, king. And just like the Americans a few years before, the French fought for liberty and equality. Good things. And at first, most Americans supported the French Revolution because they were reminded of their own struggle for liberty just a few years before that. Um, and Fr France, they were our allies, so it's good to see your friends fighting for the things that are near and dear to your heart. But by 1793, 
the revolution had turned more and more, it had turned very, very violent. Um, the real, really the height of the revolution was in 1789. And that was when the storming of the Bastille, um, and some of the things you maybe talked about last year in, uh, in world studies, but by 1793, that began the infamous reign of terror. And during the reign of terror, a lot of radical reformers uh, beheaded the king and the queen and following that started using the guillotine to behead thousands and thousands of ordinary French citizens. And from its start, the French Revolution had been a rebellion against taxes and against limited basic rights, but it had become increasingly brutal. So this increased brutality, the violence began to divide Americans. Uh, there were some, like Thomas Jefferson, who condemned the beheading of the king and queen, but felt that the French still did have the right to use violence to win freedom. Basically, he said, I, I, I don't like that it has become so violent, but you have that right to use any means necessary to gain liberty and equality. While others in America, like Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, believed that it is impossible to create democracy through violence. And I want you, I want you to ask that yourself that question. What do you think about this? Do you think that the French were right and that they were justified to try and gr gain liberty through any means necessary? Um, and on, on that same kind of page, how did the French Revolution differ from the American Revolution? Uh, if we remember, there were some differences because it was two actual armies fighting against, against each other. And if you remember back when we were talking about the British plans to march through the South and uh, use their support of the Loyalists to gain support for the British Army, um, that a lot of the fighting in the South, it become very, very brutal, and uh, civilians were getting killed, and that actually turned people onto the American side. So... In America, they were a lot of people were saying yes. Uh, the French Revolution, like it's a good thing that the uh, the French people are fighting for liberty and equality, but the ways that they were going about it really kind of left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth. But uh, our next video is going to give some more background to the importance of the French Revolution to both France and to America. April of 1789 was an extremely important month in history, both in Europe and in America, because that was the month that riots broke out here in Paris, riots that signaled the start of a long and bloody conflict known as the French Revolution. April of 1789 was also the month that George Washington was inaugurated as the first President of the United States. And while the revolution that created the American nation had focused on winning independence from a distant mother country, the situation here in France was quite different because the French Revolution was not about colonies gaining independence. Instead, it focused on destroying an unfair class system and the rule of kings that had existed in France for over 800 years. Because of the class-based hatred that had developed in France over the centuries, the French Revolution was far more brutal and resulted in ten times as many deaths as the American Revolution. And even though the French Revolution lasted for ten years, it took many more decades before a successful democracy came into existence in France. Nevertheless, the revolution's effect were widespread and immediate because monarchies all across Europe lost power. And as that happened, the lives of ordinary people began to greatly improve. So these ideas that were popping up in the French Revolution really frightened a lot of European leaders because they didn't want their own people 
to do the same things that the French did to their king and queen. Um, countries like Spain, Portugal, uh, a lot of these countries that were still established monarchies were looking at what was going on in France and seeing, we really don't like what's going on here. Um, yes, it's good that people want to be free, but the way they were going about it really frightened a lot of European leaders. And soon many of the European nations started going to war with each other. And these wars would, were going to stretch out over 20 plus years. So the United States had to make a decision about what its stance was going to be. So Washington looked at what was going on in Europe specifically what started in France and what was going to, what was starting to happen in other countries and knew that he had to try and develop a foreign policy very quickly so he wanted the United States to try and stay neutral in Europe uh, but during the American Revolution a treaty had been signed between the United States and France so France now wanted to use U.S. ports to try and supply their ships and launch attacks on Britain because, again, another, another war had sparked up between France and Britain. And this upset and worried Washington because if he honored this treaty, then America might be pulled into war in Europe. And as a country, we were still very, very young and nowhere near ready to jump back into another war. And remember what we talked about yesterday about how the country was very deep in debt and still still at this time struggling to try and unify and become a united country under the U.S. Constitution. So it would have been good to honor the treaty and to uh, help France out, but Washington also knew that trying to do so might end up destroying our own country. So it's a very precarious situation to be in. And this issue over whether or not to honor the treaty divided the country, and it also divided members of Washington's own cabinet. Uh, Alexander Hamilton pointed out that the treaty had been signed with King, King Louis XVI, who is now dead, and with the king, since the king was dead, the treaty was no longer valid, which I can see that point, and that makes sense, but Thomas Jefferson argued that the United States should honor the treaty even though the king was dead, because yes, it was signed with the king, but the king was representing the country as a whole, so that also makes sense. And after a lot of debating back and forth and back and forth, Washington issued the Neutrality Proclamation in April of 1793. And the Neutrality Proclamation declared that the United States would remain neutral and it forbade Americans from e aiding either France or Great Britain during the war. So it said, we're going to stay out of it and we're not going to we're not going to honor either side. We're just going to completely stay out of all the affairs of Europe. And this would be the first of many cabinet defeats for Jefferson. And ultimately, he would leave Washington's cabinet. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The same year the cotton gin was invented, the nation of France was fighting a major war in Europe. France had asked for U.S. military support, but George Washington decided America should remain neutral. In other words, he did not want his nation to take sides in the conflict. Washington made this decision in spite of the fact that America had signed a defense treaty with the royal government of France in order to secure their crucial help during the Revolutionary War. However, by 1793, France's monarchy had been overthrown and a new government was in place. Besides that, France's main enemy, Great Britain, had become America's biggest trading partner, and the United States could not afford to lose British business. 
In the end, the U.S. policy of neutrality caused big problems and angered both the French and the British. As a result, Britain and France captured American ships, and U.S. sailors were often forced to work as crew members on British vessels. So, with the neutrality proclamation, the United States declared, we're going to stay neutral. And declaring neutrality is one thing, but there was another, another question of how to go about actually enforcing that neutrality. And it seems strange to have to actually, quote, defend neutrality, but this was, this was a problem because both France, America's old allies, and Great Britain, America's new allies, tried to pull America into their own wars and into their onto their own side of the war. So basically, we had to try and fight to stay out of other fights. So in 1793, the same year as the Neutrality Proclamation and the same year as the Reign of Terror in France, Britain captured over 250 American trading ships in the West Indies. For Well, they did so for a couple of reasons. First, to try and stop U.S. supplies from going to France. And likewise, the French started capturing American ships to stop supplies going to the British. And some Americans saw what was happening and called for war again against Great Britain. But Washington knew that the country was still way too weak to enter into another war, so he sent this guy... Chief Justice John Jay to Britain to try and talk for peace, as we can see in this uh, part one of this lovely cartoon I've created. Uh, these are my my attempt at a British ship and an American ship. It says, British capture them, say, now you're all ours. All of your sailors will work for us. But we're Americans and we're neutral. Too bad. So... Jay goes to Great Britain and negotiated a treaty, now known as Jay's Treaty, in which Britain would pay for damages to the ships that they had captured and would end up giving up the rest of their forts in the West. And in return, the U.S. would pay back all the debts it owed the British government. And these are the same debts that had led to the taxation which had led to the American Revolution. So... This treaty met with resistance because it really did nothing to protect American ships from future attacks. And if you notice, uh, when I said that it would give up the rest of the forts in the West, these are the same forts that it was supposed to give up in the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War. So Britain again signed another treaty saying, all right, we'll give up the forts. And it says, we'll pay for your damages and we'll leave the rest of the forts in the West. The U.S. says, and we'll pay back our debts, but will you please stop attacking our ships? Maybe. That's good enough for me. In 1794, Supreme Court Chief Justice John Jay was sent to London on a diplomatic mission. Its main goals were to bring an end to British interference with American trade ships and to clear up a variety of problems, some dating back to the end of the Revolutionary War. Under the treaty that Jay finally negotiated, Britain agreed to turn over forts being used to supply arms to American Indians who were trying to put a stop to U.S. settlement on their lands. These British forts were located in the western Lake Erie region near present-day Detroit and Toledo. Also under Jay's treaty, the United States agreed to stop carrying goods between France and her colonies. In exchange, the U.S. got a few minor concessions from Britain to limit its interference with American trade ships. However, as far as France was concerned, Jay's treaty merely showed that America was far from neutral because of its willingness to give in to British demands. And as a result, an undeclared war broke out between the U.S. and France. And just before retiring from office after his second term, another precedent that Washington set, that a president would only serve for two terms, 
Washington published his farewell address in which he urged the country to stay out of treaties that could potentially pull the United States into war. He didn't, oppo he didn't oppose trading with foreign nations. He was just opposed to alliances that could possibly harm the country. So these and other growing differences in the American public would lead to the development of political parties, which we will discuss next time. In 1796, towards the close of his second term in office, George Washington announced his retirement from politics. Those close to him were very sad to see him go. His farewell to the nation took the form of his farewell address, along with the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Monroe Doctrine, it is seen as one of the most profound statements of American political philosophy. Never delivered orally, the address instead appeared in newspapers throughout the country. It really is uh, difficult to overestimate uh, the importance of Washington's farewell address. Uh, Washington was uh, a rare politician who was uh, loved both when he came into office uh, and loved when he left office. Now part of the reason he was loved when he left office is that he left office. He didn't have to leave office. He could have sought uh, a third term. It was a very unusual thing in world affairs for a great leader, a great hero, a great political leader, uh, to willingly give up power, try to think of examples from the past uh, of this in any culture, any society. Uh, it's hard to come up with anybody uh, at Washington's level who turned over power, and he was admired for this. Now, it was very much in character for him to do this. After all, he, uh, at the conclusion of the revolution, having actually overthrown uh, British rule in the United States, uh, turned power over to Congress. He could have established himself as a military dictator. He had control of the army. He was very popular. He didn't do that. For example, when Washington first becomes president, there's a long discussion in Congress over how to address him. His Excellency, Your Highness, there's all this discussion of title. And Washington consults friends and, and says, you know, none of that. It, you know, I want the office to be dignified but I, I don't want to be rarefied as a king and saw that as, as quite different. So Washington is always given great credit for leaving uh, the government better than, than he found it. In his farewell address, Washington paid tribute to the benefits of having a strong federal government. The unity of government is a main pillar in the edifice of your real independence, of your tranquility at home, your peace abroad, of your safety, of your prosperity, of that very liberty which you so highly prize. Washington also stressed the importance of religion and morality to our government. Where is the security for property, for reputation, for life? if the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths, which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice. He uh, promotes the idea of what we would call patriotism, but he also very carefully outlines the need for government to be supported by other institutions. He, he looks, for example, at religion and morality. He doesn't want to deify government. He says that of all the uh, habits and dispositions that tend to promote political prosperity, political good health, religion and morality are the indispensable supports. So he's not one of these characters who comes along and, and builds a government and then tries to deify it, to make it into a god. He realizes that, uh, that government uh, isn't the end-all and be-all. Uh, that, uh, that it's part of a good society, but not the whole of a good society. And it itself uh, relies for its health and well-being on other institutions of which he says religion and morality are the most important. 
Washington also regretted the negative influence political parties might have in undermining respect for the federal government. He admonished his countrymen not to become partisans who supported the interests of a European power rather than the neutrality of their own country. All combinations and associations under whatever plausible character with the real design to direct, control, counteract, are all the regular deliberation and action of the constituted authorities are destructive to this fundamental principle. Partisanship. Today we complain about government being partisan. Well, government's always been uh, partisan. Congress has always had uh, partisanship. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing until it comes to the point at which uh, the partisans are willing for their own partisan ends to actually undermine the constitutional order. So long as we operate within the framework of the Constitution, democracy means that we're going to have disagreements. And we'll call those disagreements partisanship, and we'll be concerned about it getting out of hand. But it's not the thing fundamentally that Washington was worried about. He was worried about parties and partisanship because he feared that they would undermine the Constitution, that we would put our partisan interests ahead of our national interests, ahead of the interests that are preserved and protected ultimately by the constitutional structure. Washington warned the American people to avoid entanglement in permanent alliances with other nations. What he was fundamentally concerned about was that we would, by entangling ourselves with other nations, uh, incorporate into our politics anti-democratic ideas, that we would be corrupted by our relations with uh, foreign powers. Here again, we haven't strictly followed Washington's advice. I mean, we've pretty much freely had relations with other nations in the world and entered into treaties and agreements and so forth. But we've always, in doing so, I think proceeded with a certain amount of caution because we hear Washington whispering into our ears saying be careful. Today we live in a very different time when the United States has become a great global power. We now participate in alliances from a unique position of strength. Instead of serving as conduits for foreign influence as Washington had feared, Alliances now enable the United States to project its power into every continent. So, as we reread Washington's farewell address, we must recognize global change as well as the commitment to American independence that he urged in 1796. This is one of the reasons Washington's farewell address is regarded as one of the most profound statements of American political philosophy also regretted the negative influence political parties might have country undermining not to become partisans who supported the interests of a all combinations and associations under all whatever plausible the regular deliberation and action of the constituted partisan well government's always been uh, partisan Congress necessarily a bad thing until it comes to the point at which actually undermine uh, the constitutional order so long as we that we're going to have disagreements We'll call those disagreements, but it's not the thing fundamentally that Washington was worried about. He partisan interests ahead of our national interests, ahead of Washington the warned the American people to avoid entanglement by entangling ourselves with other nations, uh, cooperate by our relations with uh, foreign powers. Here again, we haven't had relations with other nations in the world and entered into treaties and agreements and so forth. But as we hear Washington whispering. Today we live in a very different time when the United States has become positioned global. Instead of subject its power into every continent. So well as the commitment to American independence that he urged. Which brings us to our assignment for today. Now there is no written assignment but I do want you to go back and review this lesson, maybe read through it in the textbooks, uh, because there is going to be a quiz on chapter 9, section 2 and 3. I'm not putting section 1 in there, but because the topics in 2 and 3 are very similar and they really go together. So you'll be need 
you'll need to be familiar with the key terms and the main points from today's lesson for that quiz. So some of the questions that you will need to be able to answer. Uh, what was the French Revolution and how was it different from the American Revolution? Uh, what about the French Revolution divided uh, U.S. citizens in their support? What was the Neutrality Proclamation? How did Hamilton and Jefferson differ over the issue of neutrality? What were the terms of Jay's treaty and why did some people oppose it? And what statements about the future of the United States did Washington make in his farewell address? So these are all questions that you should be able to answer by the time you take the chapter nine, section two and three quiz. All right. Well, if you have any questions, please come and find me. Otherwise, uh, good luck and have a great rest of your day.